Now, Kayala Fumia Human Development is the governing body for 13 divisions and 23 subdivisions. We deal with education, social development, health, arts. When we come from poor backgrounds, and uh, whenever we approach the government, you know, for financial assistance, now because uh, we've been marginalized in terms of being marginalized. Everything goes to those who come from the Eastern Cape, et etc. Now we we are planning to build our own schools on existing school grounds in Google Air, too, so et etc. We have spoken to government. We have spoken to local. We have spoken to provincial. We have spoken to national government. But so far, it's just talk, 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 and no action. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I guess I don't. I don't know that I have a great answer for you. <coughs> you know, if, if we if we figure this out right now, we can go win the Nobel Peace Prize together and, and retire uh, on an island, right? I would appreciate it. But, you know, I would say <laughs> you and me, baby. We're the same. But I, I do think what you're raising for me it sparks a couple thoughts. The more you can find little spaces for experimenting with taking a more experiential approach in small teams, in meeting with a particular <coughs> government official who seems a little more open, and you start to say, uh, I wish we don't have time, but I, I, Jonathan, or maybe afterward, you can talk to John. And we'll, he'll be writing for our blog soon, right? Uh, <laughs> Jonathan had some really good examples of kind of confronting very powerful positions in his university with no power and kind of a, as, a, as a student, and starting to really connect experientially just with those people and understand what, what they're going through, and, and then have them understand what he's going through. And from that came these fabulous kind of working relationships, which resulted in uh, I, I, if this was a longer talk, I would have given you the details. It's a magnificent institutional shift in a 30,000 person university. They went from like <coughs> among the worst in Canada around sustainability to among the best, maybe the best in terms of practice within about two years, like that. From just looking for those little cracks within the relationships that you have. And in a sense, it's like when you start listening to all the things and all the forces, in that kind of institutional pyramid there, I'm starting to really feel like this sounds a little too neat and too like mystical, although I am kind of mystical, so I don't know if that's a fair critique of me. That when you think big, when you try to really think big and figure out how to handle all those things, you actually make very small changes. When you think very small, like how do I make this shift right now in this relationship, in the work that I'm doing, you actually start to create bigger changes. Right? That when we try to system, so in a sense, I like the system thinkers and, and the schools filled with them, I've read them from it. I like people are saying that trying to understand the complexity of those systems, but at a practical action-oriented level, trying to get the system in your head can be quite de defeating, because you really can't. Whereas you have access to the system in your relationships and in your experiences. The system is speaking through those experiences in a way that your head will not hold. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like really find those little moments where you can start experimenting with being, sharing your what you're really experiencing, asking other people just to say, you're with a government official as your enemy, and just say, how, how are you feeling right now? Are you stressed about, who, are you getting, are you stressed about this? You look kind of stressed, <laughs> you know? Or just shifting from this is what should happen mm -hmm. to this is how I'm feeling. Okay. What struck me was that once you created that environment where people could actually open and speak about their fears, mm -hmm. it okay. seemed like there was an, an empowerment or a buy into the project. And very often organizations instill fear and, 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 and disenabled people and, and I was also struck with the example of the women's lib um, that you mentioned that some of the best social innovators of um, the past and even our times are fearless people so I think once you can get that internal expression of fear in a safe environment um, it can very often be the catalyst for people to build their faith wh whether it's their dream or the project or which I find very exciting. And how do you then create those environments for people to um, speak about their fears and overcome it? The um, big piece of this is, is starting, to, uh, starting to overcome that fear. And the step of that is just saying it. And it's really powerful when it comes from leadership positions. You know, well, I'm not talking about a leader doing this to people, getting all you guys to share. Like when a leader says, you know, I'm kind of afraid, I'm really anxious about this right now. So sorry if I'm a little short today. <coughs> Watch what happens in a room when someone does that, who's the principal of the school. Um, I don't know if this might be a bit weird, but I was just, I really enjoyed your presentation. But I think that even in this space, there are
there are things that could be worked on in terms of how I feel right now. So I think like even having the the video camera, I mean whatever, yeah. makes me feel uncomfortable in terms of speaking and addressing and then sitting in this sort of venue doesn't really conduce discussion. So I think like I don't know if this is like out of place, no. but I think uh, what I'm hearing from what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> is that like looking we're talking about social innovation, so how does this space yes. be more innovative maybe right. the next time you present or right. judging from how I feel. So the yeah. two things from that, so <laughs> two lessons for me of what you're saying. One is you don't have to get it all right to start, right? Mm -hmm. and, and believe me, I don't think anyone knows this lesson better than we do. Like how many times we are just pathetic at this and forget obvious things like that, you know, just, 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 it, it still works. Like if it needed perfect people to do this or if you needed to get all the, everything right, mm -hmm. it would never happen. Believe me, these people and these places are the same as in this room, right? And so you can kind of go, okay, I'm, I'm gonna screw it up 50 different ways, but if I get it right one or two, that's gonna change. So, so I, I won't take that too badly. But secondly, it also it shows like just what you're doing right now, which is I'm feeling like normally you might not say that, right? You just I'm not gonna you wouldn't say about it. And that will that will make that make that'll make me think next time and make us think and make all of us go away. Or what, why are we sitting in this stupid classroom? Did I really have to book this venue because it was the easiest? Could I have done something else? But we've gone sat outside. Should we have asked permission uh, about that? You know. Um, but I think that's the hardest part. Is to think. Yeah have intention about everything. I think right. that's what's tiring sometimes. Right. Is to always have intention. I think it's only tiring if you yeah. if, if you expect perfection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not tiring to just have the intention to screw it up as long as you're okay with screwing it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with screwing it up. But thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> whether there's a question of outside expertise being beneficial or whether it should be something that's developed from within the culture in some way. I know they're not always completely opposite, but I'm just or curious close. about how yeah. you would answer that. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't think it's a question of big interventions, and I don't even. I'm not even that interested in those, frankly. Maybe there are some. I know actually a few great OD interventions that that have some of this flavor, which I admire. But I'm really interested in the the, the way that this is in the just in the kind of day to day. And I I'm, we're feeling more and more like we see a lot of power and leverage in many small places in the organization. People who think they can't change anything can change their practices literally within the two or three people they interact with that things starting to shift. We've seen that a little bit, so we're quite interested in experimenting with that with you know, the context we're right now in South Africa, here in Cape Town, starting to look for some places and talk to some people about maybe doing that in some different environments. Where again, we're not the consultants or the coaches or anything, but we're just literally thinking through it with people. And um, yeah, just um, just a question. Have you, have you been able to prove uh, with your team experimentally that the level of happiness or commitment at work in a social innovation uh, or social organization uh, would be higher than uh, in another type of, 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 of organization? And what would be your indicators? How did you, would you choose your group control groups? Or is there, is there some, some kind of experimental framework around which no. we work? No, no, I think it would be interesting. We're starting, starting to write some more academic papers out of this work, and then I'd be certainly happy for other people to take that kind of experimental approach. It's not the approach we've taken. We've really been in a grounded theory, theory building, not theory testing. So just saying, something's going on here. We can, I can give reams of kinds of uh, ethnographic and interview-based data saying that, that over and over again people are describing their experiences here differently and in detail and we start to create some theoretical constructs why that might be then so that's a that's an earlier phase than a testing phase in a real academic kind of structured thing so we've not done a lot of that uh, it's not really my area of research my kind of that methodology but it'll be I think as we start to write these articles and have these conversations it'll be quite interesting for people that do like to do that with some more metrics to put that on questions here um, I realize most of your research was done with organizations that had a specific social purpose. Yes. But in a time when the lines are being blurred between for-profit and non-profit and people that have explicit social purpose and those that are trying to create shared value, why stop at, at saying that this is revolutionary for organizations that have an explicit purpose to innovate socially? And is there not a plenty of value um, for organizations that are on for-profit in the for-profit sector? Well, well, certainly, so two parts of that. One is the organizations that are in the for-profit sector but they do have an explicit social purpose of which there are an increasing number of hybrid social enterprise. We do, we do talk to them, we are you know, interested in that. We're gonna be doing some research 
with some of those organizations more, and we have been in conversation, although it's not been the majority of who we talk to. So that's an easy connection, because they are social purpose organizations who use market <coughs> tools, yeah. fine. Organizations that wouldn't even define themselves that way, they're just healthy businesses. Yeah. There's a lot here, I think, that would make that business healthier, for sure. But I do think at some point, you, there's some of this is driven by the, by the feeling that, you know, we have a purpose that's bigger than just making this organization thrive. That's part of what we're doing. Um, that some of this is hard to get to until you s place yourself there. And actually, nonprofits can get caught up in that just pr pretty easily too. Where it's like I, it's just about this organization surviving and our egos and our this, the world will just die if we don't get funding next year. Versus mm -hmm. maybe we should maybe we're done. You know? yeah. So this is not endemic to just to, to for profits. You know, not specific to them. Um, but I think that's right. I think there's plenty of room to push the conversation there. I'm really interested in people who are in those environments, what they make of it, and how, how they experiment. It's not been our, our background, and, and so the kinds of people we work with more formally, other than some small social entrepreneurs who have businesses with quite explicit social missions. Um, you know, we're, we're just starting to work with some bigger businesses here in South Africa, actually, so that'll be interesting for us. But, <coughs> well, point well taken. There's one here. Yeah, Tim. Earlier you said that organizations can easily become indulgent and basically commiserating in a circle. Have you identified anything, because in my experience people struggle really to celebrate some things that are positive and don't readily talk about that because we socialize constantly to talk about the negative things and reinforce that. Have you found that they, in, from, from going in that spiral, have you identified a catalyst to actually shift gear? There's certainly some kind of catalytic OD techniques like appreciative inquiry which can help with that. Um, part of it might be literally someone like you sitting in a room naming that. My experience is where all we're doing is bitching. Oh yeah, mine too, mine too, mine too, mine too. Oh, well what are we like? Boom, five minutes. Uh, I think that, like many other aspects of this, are in our hands if we say, here's a dimension of experience, my experience, that is not is really being run over. My desire to celebrate and appreciate. And we're not doing that. I'm gonna voice it. Or I'm gonna ask someone about that. You know? And then that starts to create the shit. Um, so, sorry, we had one burning, there's hands going there, yes? Okay, yeah. the last one. Again, what is the catalyst from the change in the, the teacher setting that you were talking about? Like, what was the catalyst from them, uh, things not working or them being despondent or whatever, to them suddenly being also uh, yeah, wanting to learn or uh, creating a learning culture between the teachers? Tana's telling me to answer you with a story, but I think it's too long to okay. tell, so I'm going to, at the risk of marital discord, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'll um, break up with you too, tell it. Um, <laughs> okay, I won't tell. <laughs> I'll make it short. Um, so first of all, to be honest, let's be honest, that this, this school and many of the places we study were founded with that kind of spirit already. So people were coming, the people came from many other places with, with decades sometimes of, of, the, of what you're talking about, that kind of <coughs> spirit. But they, this wasn't kind of a changeover within the school. We're, one of the things we're doing right now is actually talking to a bunch of people in, in, in South Africa about doing some educational you know, within schools and thinking about this within existing institutions. And we're really interested in that question. I have a kind of faith that this can work, but we don't have a lot of great evidence of that yet because we mostly work with places that have been quite explicit. We've learned from them, and now we're interested in seeing without intervention, you know, without big, how, how can that happen? So I don't know if we have great answers other than the same kinds of look for the little moments. But I think that the power of even one kind of conversation, having it in a group of people in that environment can be profound. So I'll end with this example, which I love. Right before that school opened, Southwest Baltimore Charter School opened its doors. The staff was getting together for some professional development training and connection. They didn't even know each other very well. And they were going to do a workshop on dialogue. And they need something to dialogue about. And the, the two the co-founders of the school said, well, I think we should, we've been kind of battling a little bit about how should the students address us? Because there's different opinions. You know, some people say it should be Mr. Nilsson. Other people, I don't want to be my friend, I want you to call me Warren. And these were little kids. They, now, now they go up to about 14, but they started then. It was just the first few grades. So they're five, six, seven, eight years old. And then in that region, there's also a Mr. Warren, you know, Mr. with the first name. Different opinions. The consultant who was helping the school start said, don't waste your time with that. My God, you got you know, 200 kids coming in here and, you know, in a couple weeks you've got to be ready for this. That's crazy. But they felt it was important somehow. Not even sure why. <coughs> so they kind of had this dialogue for what turned into like an hour and a half, two hours. And you, know, you should be rolling your eyes like, oh my God, horrible, horrible. I don't want to be in that. 
And it started with just kind of normal arguing. Yeah, no, it should, it's got to be about this. You got to say, Mr. Nielsen, because that's respect. That's respect, and the kids need to learn respect, and the parents won't respect it. And someone else saying, no, you know what, actually, I don't think that's respect. I, I like to be called by my first name. I like the real thing. That's where, that's just where you're from. You don't even know. You're not from the city. You don't know what it's like, you know. It started to get quite heated. And then people started crying. They cry a lot. This <laughs> <laughs> but this time, they weren't, they weren't happy. This, this cry. They were pissed, and they were, you know, the, the people were like, everyone's sure that this is the right way to think about it, because this is my culture, and this is what respect means. And, I said, well, my first name's important to me, and people have always been pronouncing it wrong, and I want to use that, and just, <laughs> crazy, right? And they spent time with this, and mo again, this, most places say this is too slow, and too indulgent, and you're wasting your time, and you got, you got an emergency situation out here, you know, and you've got to deal with it. Who cares what you're called? They stuck with a little bit, and people really started sharing experiences, and, 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 and really hearing each other, and recognizing, wow, that means a lot to you, that little thing. Think on what is caught up in that. You know, your idea of identity and of respect and status and your cultures and traditions just in that address, right? There's a ton of institutional stuff caught in there. And then at some point, there's a suggestion like, well, what if each person could choose how they want to be addressed? And there was some discussion <laughs> around that, you know, like, well, would that confuse the kids? It's not that confusing. Like, you, you ask what someone wants to be, how they want to be addressed, and you address them that way. You want to be called Mr. Nelson? I'll call you. That's respectful. Will the parents think we're unprofessional? Let's try it. We can probably explain it to them why we're doing this. And that's what they ended up doing. So now you see like the name tags literally that are written out on their office doors and stuff are different for different people and that's gone. And what they got to really quickly, I think that's quick. Two hours might not sound quick, but that was, a, that was part of the larger practice that was transforming the place was the experience <coughs> of respect. Not someone's signal of respect or my interpretation, but the experience of respect. The honoring, like I, I hear you saying for you it's being called you know, Ms. Jones. Good, I, that's fine, that's just, let's, let's, let's build that in if we can. But that doesn't mean she has to be called, she can be called you know, Nancy, whatever. Um, and so, so that was like seeding the same kind of dynamic that we would see over and over again, where you take that seriously, you get the raw material, and that's kind of a nice little innovation. And that's actually, in a multicultural world, a diverse world, in a diverse city, having people, having students say, start to learn, how do you negotiate that? How do you actually, how are you respectful with different traditions and not just fighting them? And, and how can you, can, and it's not confusing to have all, all that kind of, to me, again, a tiny little example that's got enormous implications for social change. And the school is doing that kind of thing over and over again. And I don't see why you couldn't have that say, we think there's so many rules in our heavily institutional, and there are, but there are a lot more things that there aren't rules, they're just habits, a lot more. We have a lot more room for, for liberal, you know, free action. It'd be the most hide bound institutionalized places that we know. That no one's gonna fire you if you'd like say, hey, can we do this? Oh yeah, okay. Most people won't even notice you're doing it very often. So I don't see why we couldn't experiment with those kinds of things in those environments, but I can't prove it. You know, so I'm hoping to, hey, you wanna let's wanna do something, let's give me power cards up here, websites up there. Like we're really interested in, in thinking about this with people in, in, the, in, the, in on the ground and seeing what happens. What's the worst that could happen? We ruin everything, it's a disaster. <laughs> I mean, the world's in pretty tough shape anyway, so my, my worry that we're gonna make it much worse is pretty low compared to my optimism that we can go.